Good morning. It's so good to have each and every one of you back here again with us this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Luke. Today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 6. So if you have your Bible with you and handy, just go ahead and open up your Bible to Luke chapter 6 and uh, we'll be getting started in just a moment. But we want to begin, of course, with a word of prayer. I'm going to be leading you in prayer and I invite you as you sit there in, in, in your home or, or wherever you are and watching online, I invite you to, to lift up the names of those who you are concerned about, uh, mention to God the situations in your life that, that are troubling you, because God is able to do all things. He promises that we should lift these things up to Him. He says we, oftentimes we, we have not because we have asked not. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we praise You. And we thank You, Lord God, that we can come into Your presence this morning. Uh, even though we are separated by distance, Lord, we are connected by uh, uh, electronics this morning. And, and Lord, we can hear each other and we can see each other. And we ask, Lord, that you would, you would guide our hearts as we open your word together. Lord, uh, you promised that where two or more are gathered together, there you will be also. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us from these, these words, from your scriptures. Lord, we, we have many concerns in, our, in this day and age. Uh, Lord, there are many things that are troubling about our world and our situation. We have... We have many loved ones uh, who are sick and ill uh, today. Uh, the, the COVID virus, as you know, is, is continuing to, to grow in, in our nation and in our communities. And Lord, we ask that you would provide healing for, for each one of those that are near to us who, who are ill this morning. Lord, that you would provide the healing that they need. Lord, we, we ask that you would provide healing in situations where, where people need emotional healing and, and psychological healing, Lord, in addition to the physical healing. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts as we, uh, as our nation enters into a, a change of government in just a few days. Uh, Lord, we, we have concerns and, and trepidations uh, about changes in government, Lord, is, and we, we hand these things over to you, and we ask, Lord, that, that your will be done. In, in these situations, Lord, we ask that you would guide us as, as we live our lives and as we, as we submit ourselves to the government that you have placed over us. And Lord, we ask always that your will be done. Speak to us now from your word. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If we go look at Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 12... We see that Jesus went off to a mountain by himself and spent a whole night in prayer. And when he returned the next day, he, he selected 12 from the many disciples who had been following him. And to those 12, he called them apostles. We see that in verse 13. Apostles in the Greek, the Greek word for apostles means those who are sent out. Luke is the only gospel writer who says that Jesus considered many of those who followed him disciples, but that he called this main twelve apostles. After this point in Luke, whenever Jesus refers to disciples, he is likely referring to many of his followers in addition to the 12 apostles. Now what we're going to see in our lesson today is a key ingredient in the training that Jesus gives to all of his disciples, including those of us who are disciples today. He gives this training to us before he sends us out into the world as as, a, as apostles. And, and these things that he, he begins to teach us and train us in are our personal attitudes toward
toward other people. In Luke 6, 17, Luke says that that Jesus, then after, after He was on the mountain, He came down with them and He stood on a level place where there was a large crowd of His disciples and a great throng of people from other places, from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. And turning his gaze toward his disciples, Jesus began to deliver a sermon that is very similar in many ways to the Sermon on the Mount that is recorded in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. The sermon in Matthew is introduced under different circumstances, though, where we read in Matthew 5, 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Thus, the title Sermon on the Mount has been given to this sermon in Matthew, And many biblical scholars point out that since Luke's account is slightly different in wording from the sermon in Matthew, Luke's account is another, though very similar, sermon. These scholars therefore entitle Luke's account the Sermon on the Plain, or the Level Place. Now as we come down to to verse 20 in chapter 6, like Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, Luke's Sermon on the Plain begins with a similar set of beatitudes or blessings from God that are placed upon those who follow Jesus. We see this very clearly in verse 20 just before the Beatitudes, that Jesus turned His gaze toward His disciples and He speaks these Beatitudes. But what is different is in the Sermon on the Plain, immediately following Jesus speaking the Beatitudes or the blessings to those who are His disciples, He speaks a set of woes to those who are not following Him. The Greek word translated woe, W-O-E, can be interpreted horror, or how dreadful life will be for those who are not followers of Jesus and thereby will not be receiving the greatest of the blessings from God. Jesus begins the woes with the word but. Okay, He had just turned to His disciples and pronounced the Beatitudes, the blessings, and now He he turns His gaze to those who are not His disciples and He starts His statements with the word but. Look in verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets In the same way, the greatest of God's blessings is to walk every day in personal relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus. These greatest blessings come only to those who repent of their sins and walk in faith in Jesus, the Christ. Imagine how different and how much more pleasant the world would be 
that people generally could resist the temptations to act selfishly and instead to follow God's loving ways of life toward others. Can you imagine how much better relationships might be among families, co-workers, church members, and even entire communities if all people generally live to benefit others instead of living solely for ourselves? Jesus tells us this is indeed possible if we each will follow Him. Let's look at how that works. Coming down to Luke 6, 27. Let's look at verses 27 and 28. Jesus says, But I say to you, who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus offers this key advice for living to those who want to actually hear the words of wisdom from God with a desire to obey them. In the, in the Christian Standard Bible, that, that Greek word is translated listen i.e. choose, personally choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ in converse to living life as non-believers. Jesus did not merely tell others to love your enemies. He demonstrated this kind of universal love toward all others in every situation of his own life. This type of godly love is commanded by, for each of his followers by Christ Jesus. As he said, to love your enemies and to do good to those who hate you. Throughout Scripture, we are told often that God hates evil behavior and thought. If we think back to when we were in our last study, when we were looking in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 61, the Lord is speaking to the people of Israel, the people of Judah, and He's telling them about the Messiah to come, and, and talking about what it should be like for those who place their faith in Him and follow Him as compared to those who are, are living life for self. In Isaiah 61, 8, God says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. And I will faithfully give them recompense. In other words, God is going to give justice to every single person who has ever lived based on the state of their heart. But he also says in that same sentence, he says, faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. That's speaking of the everlasting covenant that will come through the Messiah. And then in verse 9 he goes on to say, And then their offspring will be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the people. All who see them will recognize them because they are offspring whom the Lord has blessed. God loves all people. Enough to die in my place and in your place. What he hates are selfish behaviors. God is able to focus his hatred on sinful behaviors while maintaining his love for the person. 
even those enemies who attack him and his children. Christ Jesus commands his disciples to do likewise. In fact, we, those of the everlasting covenant that comes through the Messiah Jesus, are commanded to to help do good to those who hate us as a general practice or behavior and thereby be known among all the nations for that great love that we have for other people. Interspersed between these exhortations is the observation that anything less than this type of conduct is unworthy of the follower of Jesus. If we look back at Luke 6, verse 28, it says, Bless bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. You might say, wow, Pastor Steve, that sounds like something that's really hard to do. Yes, it is. It's, It's next to impossible except that God empower you to do it. He must change you. Look at, look at that word bless. This word bless requires that we not only do good to, these, to all other people, but that we desire God's blessings that he gives to us as believers for those people as well. To bless involves asking God to show his favor on that person. In the converse, to curse connotes a malevolent desire for continual harm. In fact, the believer in Jesus should pray for those who are persecuting or cursing you or mistreating you. This command by Jesus went against the popular Jewish teachings of his day. The rabbis of that day taught their hearers to bless those who bless them and to curse those who curse them. Jesus' command that he gives to us is much more difficult than that. This means not that we should not pray for the demise of those who curse us and mistreat us, but we should pray for their blessing by God. On this earth, God will only bless those who choose to do His will and His bidding. To pray for a person doing evil such that they would receive God's blessing is to pray for His or her repentance, redemption, and forgiveness by God. This is much like what we see when Jesus was being crucified on the cross. He looked down on those below him who had nailed him to that cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now let's come back to our text and look at verses 29 and 30. Whoever hits you on the cheek Offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Jesus offered some examples of the the active nature of a transformed Christian heart where God's love translates from our hearts to our godly behavior. In Jesus' day, as it is in most every day, a punch in the face represented the consummate insult. The law in that day allowed the offended person to retaliate in like manner. In other words, if, a, if the person's nose got broken by the 
the initial blow, the law permitted the victim to break the nose of the offender. This is called the law of retaliation. Jesus called upon his disciples to go beyond that law by demonstrating the radical law of love. In the book of James, James calls this God's royal law. And in his, in his statement, he quotes in James 2.8, Leviticus 19.18, where God commands His people to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Christian groups who would some centuries later like the Amish, interpret this law so completely that they totally forbade human violence of any kind, including military service. Now, mainline Christian groups have always interpreted this law as forbidding violence as personal retaliation or to satisfy personal hatred, but not extending to protection of one's family, friends, home, or nation, which God often commands, especially the the man of the house, to, to protect. A coat in verse 29, looking back at verses 29 and 30, the coat was a reference to the the outer garment worn over a person's clothing. Perhaps Jesus was depicting a situation where someone shed their their long outer garment to do some work, possibly under the hot sun, to, to stay a little bit cooler. Then while they were working, another person came along and stole his coat, his outer garment. In that case, Jesus insisted that the shirt or the inner garment be given to the thief as well. Assuming that that person has a real need for clothing that he cannot meet on his own. Jesus urged the giving of the inner garment as an intentional act of goodwill or benevolence. Jesus is stating a general principle for Christian living in this these verses, where the believer in him continually gives of himself in order to meet the needs of others. As a Christian or Christ's church, as as we do this over and over in this world, many will simply take what you give them and will walk away. You may never see nor hear from that person again. Our Lord commands that we do not demand repayment and that we do not stop giving that same help to other people as a result. Verse 31. Treat others the same way as you want them to treat you. We see here Jesus' expression of what we have come to call the golden rule. The Jews in Jesus' day taught this concept in a more negative way. So Jesus is, is correcting that concept. Their concept said if you don't like something done to you, don't do it to others. Or... Don't hurt other people, and they won't have a reason to hurt you. Christians are to go beyond causing no hurt in life. We are to work to actually bring God's love to a lost and dying world, which is filled with hate. Christians are to go to the point of living expressly with a purpose to help other people, expecting nothing in return. 
This requires from each one of us as a believer in Jesus Christ a sensitivity to exactly go and help where the individual is hurting in order to help in the best way and to avoid being an enabler of practices which hurt other people. Let's go down to to Luke 6, 32 and 33, where it speaks of having a pure heart. You know, we can act one way, but our heart and our mind can be thinking in an opposite way. For clarification of what Jesus means by good deeds of believers in Him, Jesus here gives us three examples in which Christian love should exceed the natural human response to other people. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, What credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Many people in the world show love to those who love them. Certainly, there's nothing wrong with loving people who love us and and appreciating what they do for us. However, Jesus is pointing out to His followers that even sinners love those who love them. In other words, nothing about this kind of behavior brings glory to God and into this world. It is merely a part of being human. At the same time, Jesus was not trying to motivate His disciples to seek some kind of credit for doing good deeds, saying, what credit is that to you? The Greek word for credit is the same word normally used elsewhere in the New Testament as grace. Grace is favor that cannot be earned. It is a godly characteristic freely given by God out of His pure love for every person. Loving the people who love us does not reveal the grace of God to the world or any real kindness on a human level. Those who truly live by the golden rule live selflessly, expecting nothing in return for these good deeds. Giving love in exchange for love requires no sacrifice on my part or your part. Giving love to those who refuse to love in return requires grace, God's grace from you and me. Jesus often urges His disciple to distinguish himself or herself by being a person of God who benefits the helpless, treating them in the same way as his or her family. That's an interesting concept in that Jesus will teach believers in Him that we are all family. We are all members of of God's family. Christ-like love is augmented by doing benevolent acts. Benevolent acts. Benevolence is defined as doing kind acts out of good will while expecting not expecting to personally profit from any of those kind acts. 
The believer should distinguish himself or herself by being one who benefits the helpless that he or she does not even know, as well as his or her friends and family and acquaintances and neighbors. For even the unbelieving, those who have not been changed by God, help their friends and their family. We as believers should be known by giving love graciously. Giving love that has not been earned by someone else. Verses 34 and 35. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Hmm, now God is going to start talking to you and me about our money. This becomes a sore subject with many of us. He goes on to say, even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High. For He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. These benevolent acts for the believer extend to the lending of our money and our possessions. Every person lends with the expectation of receiving back the principal amount. I'll lend it, I'll give it to you if you'll someday later give it back to me. Jews, following the Old Testament law, would not normally charge interest to their countrymen. They would they would lend just that way. I'll give, you, I'll give you $10 if you promise to in return re- give me that $10 back in a later date. But Jesus says that his followers should give benevolently, benevolently expecting nothing in return. With this kind of benevolent or good lending, God says He will give us great reward. Believers are to be what they really are, sons of the Most High God, and to lend as God lends. God is kind and ungrateful to evil men. He is kind and ungrateful to evil men. In in his account, Matthew 5.45 quotes Jesus as saying of God's way of giving. Now this is good. God has made all things in in heaven and earth. And Jesus says that God causes His Son, the Son that rises every morning in the east and sets every evening in the west. We don't lay awake at night wondering if the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Because God causes His sun to shine, to rise and shine on the evil as well as the good. And He sends rain on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. The day will come when the world will realize and recognize God's children and they will be seen as people who gave benevolently as a matter of habit, expecting nothing in return, to be godly in the way we give, to give graciously of all that we have. Luke, in his account, is inspired by God to bring forward Jesus' emphasis on kindness to others as the habitual good works of believers, expecting nothing in return, Christians live in the context of self-centered of a self-centered world which says take care of yourself first. Living a self-sacrificial or Christ-like life in the 21st century 
requires hard choices that even our friends and family might not understand and we might be criticized for our benevolence. In verse 35, Jesus uses the Greek contrasting conjunction translated into English as but to emphasize the difference between these examples and what he expects believers and himself to do. Followers of Jesus should behave differently than the worldly people who love, help, and lend to people dependent upon what they might receive in return. Instead of loving only people who love us, Jesus calls upon us to love our enemies. For he himself is kind and, and to ungrateful and evil men. We are to do good things expecting nothing in return. Jesus promises that this kind of benevolent behavior will resort, result in great reward from God. This is God's grace. Verse 36 tells us, Be merciful, for just as your Father is merciful. Now mercy is not giving people what they deserve. Okay? When people do bad things, showing mercy is, is holding back and not giving them bad things in return. If somebody hits you in the cheek, the merciful thing would be not to hit them back. Be merciful singles out that area of life in which, given the preceding examples, one is very likely to come short because we impulsively act in our sinful human behave, behaviors. We impulsively return evil for evil. Jesus would later speak woes to the Pharisees because they tithe their very intricately, even their spices to God, but they neglected to show justice and mercy and faithfulness to other people. Christ calls for believers to display a mercy, not giving punishment. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that this kind of mercy exceeds that of the Pharisees and the very religious. And it extends to all people. And we're called upon to show mercy like God gives mercy. Let's come down to verse 37. Jesus says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Jesus instructed His, merci his merciful disciples with two negative commands followed by two positive commands. Number one, Jesus said in verse 37, He says, Do not judge. This command does not refer to court proceedings. This talks about a personal judgment that I make on another person. As I see that other person living their life, I make a judgment on them. Jesus even prohibited hurtful criticism of others. Some people try to make ourselves look, out, look good by making others look bad. Only God is a righteous judge. And therefore, only God can rightfully judge other people. Because He knows the heart and every fact and every mat matter that goes on in this world. Only God knows those things. And whenever you or I refuse to judge others, God promises when we hold back our judgment on other people, as a result, God says, you will not be judged. God shows mercy 
to those who leave judgment to him. Now the second negative statement, God, Jesus says to us, do not condemn. The Greek word for condemn has a similar source as judge, but it's connected to the pronouncement of the punishment or the sentence that's received for a crime. Not only can we judge people sometimes, but we can also pronounce their punishment. You ought to have this or that bad thing happen to you because you did or said that. Condemnation goes one step further past criticism. Condemnation is the arrogant assignment of guilt and even punishment for another's perceived actions. It is hypocritical. If you or I do not condemn others, then God promises that you or I will not be condemned. Okay? Then God gives, Jesus gives two positive statements. The first one is pardon. The Greek word translated pardon can be translated forgive. It means to set free. A forgiving Christian holds no grudges either. The Christian who forgives remains free to receive the complete forgiveness that only God gives. And so when, God, when Jesus says, pardon others, he adds, and you will be pardoned by God. This, this goes right along with the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. When Jesus said, pray this way, Lord God, forgive me in the same way that I forgive others. Wow, that's a pretty, that's a pretty amazing and daring statement, is it not? To ask God to forgive me in the same way that I forgive others? Now for the second positive statement, look at verse 38. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. This charge by Jesus Christ goes beyond all the others. Christ commands His disciples to make provision for those who might otherwise receive judgment or condemnation. To be like Christ, who is God in human flesh, is to give generously and graciously. Jesus used a, a purchase of grain to illustrate the point. A, a person would come with a container that's supposed to hold, say, a bushel of grain. And the person who gives generously would pour that grain in that container and then he would, he would tamp it down and he would shake it on and bounce it on the ground to, to cause the grains to move closer to, and closer together in the package so that a little bit more they would come down in their level and then he would pour more in and he would tamp those down and he would shake them down and then he would put more in and fill up the container until it was overflowing. A generous and gracious person opens himself up to be taught by God to give with God's type of generosity. In Psalm 23, 5, it says that in reference to our blessings from God, my 
cup overflows. This is speaking of the same type of generosity that God gives to every person whose heart is conditioned to be like the heart of God. Now we come down to verse 39, and we read verses 39 and 40. And he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into the pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher, if they are fully trained. Now let's come down to verse 41. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your eye. Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck that is in your take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. The speck denotes a very small object that cannot even be seen unless the other person gets their face right up next to yours and looks into your eye and sees that tiny little speck. The log denoted a very large object that would be obvious and would cause total blindness if it was in your eye. Jesus used humor here to make his point. The word picture pointed out the ridiculous nature of a judgmental person. Every single one of us has our faults and our flaws. That's not to make an excuse for doing things that we shouldn't, but it's the truth. We have all sinned and fallen far short of the glory of God. Every one of us stands in God's presence humbly before Him because of our sinfulness. The question becomes, do I tend to be harder on others than I am on myself? Do I see their sins, but I never see my own? Do I look at them and never look into my own heart? The bottom line is that I do better to let God deal with the sins of other people. I will be busy enough with God dealing with my own sins. Second half of verse 42, Jesus says, You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your, out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Jesus insists that his disciples personally focus on their own sins. Jesus calls the person who does not consider his own sin a hypocrite. In classical times, the Greek term for hypocrite meant to explain, interrupt, or provide an answer. By the time of Jesus' day, It represented an actor in a play who played the part of a person pretending to be someone else. These hypocrite actors would wear masks and costumes as well as disguise their voices. Eventually, the word came to express negative connotations, an insincere or corrupt person. A person who was pretending to be something that he or she was not. Let's go down to verse 43. Jesus said, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills His heart. We 
We come down to verse 46. And Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? A person who calls Christ Jesus Lord, but does not do what He says, is not a true follower, is lying to others. Such a person just practices lip service to to God, pretending to be a disciple of His. His actions never match the words of His Lord. We never do, this, this person never does godly things. Disobedience to the Lord God is the definition of sin. And it brings serious and dire and serious and the most dire of consequences. Verse 47. Jesus said, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Jesus intended show you or to illustrate the picture of an obedient believer. The one who hears the words of Jesus Christ and makes them a part of his or her heart and acts on them accordingly is the definition of obedience. A builder, must, a builder in, in our world must, must exert diligence and extra effort to find something solid upon which to lay the foundation. Therefore, what what good builders do is they dig down into the dirt until they reach the bedrock and they place the foundation or support the foundation that they're going to build the house upon. They, They support it on the bedrock that is underneath, the part that is unmovable. The dirt can be swept away, but the bedrock will not move. The same is true for each one of us in our lives. We need to build our lives and remodel our hearts to match the heart of God. And then our behavior should be changed to behave in the ways that God commands. Look in verse 49. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And a torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. The Greek word for ruin there is riagma. And it can also be translated wreck or collapse. The ruin that will come upon our lives if we don't trust in God and live by His ways is that our life will be a wreck. It will collapse. The Greek word for great is megas. It's the place where we get the word mega. So the person who does not build his or her life on faith in Jesus Christ and live his or her life by God's ways will find that his or her life is a mega disaster, a catastrophe. Do you want a good life? Well then, repent of your sins and place, live by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus life, Jesus Christ and, and live your life in obedience to Him. Let's pray. Father, we hear these words from You 
as you have spoken them to us through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, as living our lives and on this earth and in this sinful human flesh that we occupy, Lord, we, we realize how difficult it is to, to love our enemies, to not repay evil to our enemies, but to repay a, a full-orbed love toward each and every person that we would hate sinful acts, but we would love every, other, every person that we encounter just the way that you love, that we show grace to others and not hatred. Lord, help us to, to walk in these ways and, 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 and our, help us for, to make our lives a match with with, with you in, the, in your walk, Lord Jesus, the way you walked in your life when you were here on this earth. Help us to, to walk in that way that you modeled for us. Lord, we humbly come before you today. We, we come on our knees, humbly repenting our sinfulness to you and, and, and deciding, Lord, to, to turn our lives over to you, to to allow you to lead us and guide us in every step of our lives. For you, Lord, to take occupancy of our heart, to show us how to walk, how to live, how to relate to others in a way that's pleasing to you and according to your perfect will. Lord, guide us in all that we do. We, we have heard you speak. Lord, Take our repentance. Allow us to trust in you and to live life in your ways and be called the sons of God. It's in Jesus' great name that we pray. Amen.